Hello, and welcome back to our economic update series. In this series, we'll leverage a variety of financial experts to help you better understand the impact of various economic, socioeconomic, and market factors. I'm Brad Scott, Vice President of Wealth Management by Community America, and we're excited that you've joined us today to learn more about the current state of the market and other market indicators that could impact your financial future. And today, uh, we're joined by Mike Laughlin, head of the Portfolio Strategist team at Morningstar. Prior to Morningstar, Mike was with BlackRock for 12 years. He's a chartered financial analyst charter holder, and he's a graduate of Gettysburg College. Talent like Mike and managers like Morningstar are examples of the kind of access that Wealth Management by Community America brings to our members. But before I turn the conversation over to Mike, I wanted to let you know we'll have a brief Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So if you have questions along the way, please type those into our, our questions box and we'll address as many as the time that we have together. So Mike, I know that many of our members have been asking the same kinds of questions that many of your clients are asking. So we thought this would be a good opportunity to answer some of those today, uh, including the current state of the market, maybe where it's headed, and uh, how it'll affect our finances. So, Mike, what would you like to share with us today? Yeah, thank you, Brad. The first thing I want to share is just how excited I am to be here. And I want to thank everybody on the line for their time and attention today. As mentioned, I'm Mike Laughlin. I lead what's called the Portfolio Specialist Team at Morningstar. And we're really responsible for partnering with great financial advisors like those at Wealth Management by Community America um, and their clients on portfolio construction, um, market dynamics, risk management, uh, sort of everything related to uh, the portfolio. And I'm really excited to be here today to talk about what we're seeing in terms of current market dynamics and economic developments. I think this is a particularly challenging time just because there is certainly a lot of different uh, signals. There's a lot of cross currents and there's a lot of what I would characterize as just high uncertainty. And if you are feeling the same way, I would say, you know, don't, uh, don't feel alone. There's a uh, dissent amongst the Fed. There's a lot of dissent amongst uh, professionals on Wall Street about whether or not the economy's in a reasonably good spot or whether or not we're about to hit a recession. So uh, I think the point, the word that I would emphasize is again, insert, uh, uncertainty. Uh, I, I think it's important though to, to distinguish uncertainty from being negative. Uncertainty just means that there's a potentially wide range of outcomes uh, that we're facing. And we'll spend some time talking about what that means in the context of how you build a portfolio. I'll, uh, I'll share at the, uh, the front end, it generally means um, that we want to take smaller bets. And uh, at Morningstar, our philosophy is that uh, we want to pre prepare, not predict. So uh, we'll expand a little bit on that as well. And then I do want to talk um, towards the end about what I think is the single greatest threat to somebody reaching uh, their long-term goal. So a lot of fun stuff in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, um, just talking a little bit about what we're seeing in markets today and in recent period. And as many of you uh, probably know, the last um, you know five, seven years has actually been pretty darn good. And you can see that um, this is uh, stock market S&P performance since 2016. And you know, it's easy to uh, forget the different market uh, events that have happened over that time period, but you had a global growth scare heading into 2016. You had Brexit. We had trade wars. The uh, fourth quarter of 2018, if anyone remembers, was particularly painful. And then obviously COVID and now inflation. But I, one of the core messages that I would share is that if you take a longer time, uh, if you look over a longer with a longer perspective, so uh, year to date uh, asset returns look pretty good. Um, and we're seeing some of the dynamics that happened in 2022 uh, reverse themselves again. So um, those dynamics being the difference in, in performance between growth stocks and value stocks. Growth stocks are actually uh, doing quite well here to start the year. Value a little bit underperformed, but value is what outperformed last year. Additionally, one of the things that's changed is international stocks are actually uh, outpacing the U.S. Um, it's this, 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 you know, this is actually this dispersion's grown a little bit wider um, since since we put this slide together. Uh, it's about 200 to 300 basis points now. So, uh, international outperforming the U.S. 
over the last 10 years, I mean, it's what an unbelievable time to be an investor. And, uh, you know, for those of you that were in the markets, and I'm sure you were with the great financial advice that you're getting, uh, you know, it was an amazing period of, of overall returns, higher than what we typically see in terms of long-term historic returns. That's okay. And um, even if, you know, future returns over the next one, three, five years moderate a little bit from what we experienced, it's still set up for a, you know, a pretty good go forward. Um, what was very painful about last year and, and what you're seeing here is in the blue is stocks and in the red is bonds. Um, what was really painful about last year is that both stocks and bonds declined together. And that's actually fairly unusual. So this data goes back to 1990. And just, just sort of look at the colors, right? When you see, for the most part, those significant uh, negative blue bars, obviously the big one being 2008, but in the early 2000s during the tech crisis as well, what you actually see is positive red bar, so positive fixed income performance. And that's uh, that's typically the case. It's sort of like the pillar that that you know modern portfolio construction is built around is that you know those correlations between stocks and bonds are you know flat to negative. 2022 was a you know, I, I think more of an anomaly given where interest rates started that time period and then the driver of a lot of that the the volatility uh, in both stocks and bonds being inflation. We think today with where rates have moved, like a lot of that pain has already been felt and it was felt last year. It's just, it was so acute because other than holding cash and, and, and maybe, you know, commodity exposure, which typically is pretty volatile and nobody's really going to build an all commodity portfolio. There was really nowhere else to hide. And it's just one of those time periods in markets that happens where we need to ride things out. Um, over the long run, Diversification does win, right? Balanced portfolios do win, and you see sort of in this, uh, you know, a number of years. And I, I just like, you know, it's almost like a a jar of jelly beans. The colors are all changing all the time. What what stands out to me is that, you know, in that balanced portfolio that you see linked um, with the with the line there. You're never the top performer, but you're never the worst performer. And that's actually a great place to be, but it never feels like a great place to be. And the reason for that is, you know, it's always keeping up with the Joneses, right? Like somebody else's portfolio is always going to be potentially doing a little bit better, right? Maybe they were heavily concentrated in tech stocks, or maybe, you know, you had a neighbor who was really into the meme stock craze with GameStop and uh, AMC back in early 2021. You're never really going to feel great in a balanced portfolio, but investing is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And, you know, it's it's definitely is slow and steady wins the race. So it's, I think it's important to point out that, you know, even over the last couple of years, shifting market environments, this approach has really, uh, you know, held its own in terms of where it, where it ranks in, in different asset classes. Let's shift a little bit and talk about some of the things that we're seeing in markets today. And the first thing I want to talk about is is inflation, as you might imagine. Probably the you know the number one uh, word there out in the press, um, or what things are most focused on. Um, it's interesting. Inflation has uh, obviously peaked. It, this is a much different market environment than we've been in over the last ten or fifteen years, which was characterized by extremely low and um, also low volatility, low variation in the amount of inflation that we're seeing. It just wasn't moving around very much, and it was pretty low. Then all of a sudden it spiked and it spiked big, right? And I think that it's it's not just the magnitude of the move that's important to think about. It's also the speed at which this happened, and then the speed at which you know central banks around the world respond to this. What I will say um, is that uh, you know inflation has come down from its peaks. Um, you know we're running today even a little bit lower than what you see here, probably around you know four and a half to five percent. That's a good thing. I think in Morningstar's opinion, are we going to get back to 2% or less than 2% that, that we had seen in the last 10 years? Probably not anytime soon. Um, it, 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 we, we do think this can you know, be a little bit sticky uh, in the area of where we are. But, but a lot of this move, again, has happened. And a lot of the response to this increase in inflation has happened. And you see that come through um, interest rates. So the Fed's response um, is to... Uh, push interest rates up, which um, does help combat inflation. But there's, you know, it's a bit of a double-edged sword in that it can slow economic growth and it can slow 
um, hiring or increase unemployment, right? And the Fed always has this dual mandate of stable prices, which was, you know, has been defined as 2% inflation, and then, you know, full employment, which is generally around 4%, uh, uh, you know, unemployment. So it's, it's this push and pull between these two dynamics that we're seeing right now with where inflation is at, you know, at least coming off the boil, we think, you know, that the 75 basis point moves that we were seeing, um, you know, more recently, we think that's behind us. Maybe we do still see some 25 basis point increases, um, especially if the economy itself, which we'll talk about, remains reasonably resilient. There's just going to be a little bit, as I mentioned, right, it's the cross currents in economic data, cross currents in markets. That feels really uncomfortable to where we were over the last, you know, ten years. But it's not historically; it's it's not actually out, that far out of the norm. And again, more importantly, I think what has caught portfolios and market participants somewhat off guard is just the speed at which all of this um, has happened. So, the good news, though, is that unemployment is still quite low. Um, the U.S. economy is in you know, pretty good shape. Consumers are in pretty good shape despite um, inflation. So it, overall, uh, you know, the, the picture, it's mixed, but there are pockets that we can point to to say, hey, this actually, you know, looks pretty good. And, and unemployment is one of those areas. What's interesting, though, is if you actually, uh, if we were to survey everyone on this call, um, or just, you know, more broadly, you know, American consumers, which is exactly what the University of Michigan does, People don't feel very confident in where we're at, right? So consumer sentiment, which is a measure of how people feel about the economy, um, their personal financial situation, markets, it's below its long-term average. And it's come up a little bit recently, but it's it's still below. I actually kind of look at this as a bit of a, um, what, what can be a bit of a positive, right? To me, this signals opportunity. There's the uh, saying that you want to be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy as an investor. This to me looks like fear. So it's, I, you know, I don't know if I would back up the truck to say, let's, let's be greedy at the moment. But what I would say is that, um, you know, if, if you take more of a contrarian approach to investing, which is how Morningstar invests, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, now is the time to be actually scouring opportunities. Uh, the last thing that I'll um, touch on from an economic perspective is something called um, the yield curve. So if you're familiar with the treasury curve, you know, the U.S. Treasury issues different bonds at different maturities. So one, two, five, 10, 30 year bonds. And th that that set of maturities becomes the yields on those maturities become a curve. Um, traditionally, the curve is upward sloping. So, you know, your short term bonds yield less than your long term bonds. But at times that inverts. So you may you may have heard the term yield curve inversion. And that's where we're at today. And um, I pulled the numbers uh, actually as of today, the 10 year yields at three and a half percent, the two year yield is at 4.2%. So it's higher. Uh, in the past, you may have heard this is generally not a good sign. It's been a reasonably reliable predictor of recession. What I will say though, is it does not mean that a recession is coming tomorrow. Sometimes it, the yield curve inverts and we don't get a recession. We just get a you know an economic slowdown. Um, other times we do get a recession, but it takes quarters or years to materialize. And this is where I think it's really important. I mentioned that concept earlier of you want to prepare, but not predict. You don't, Morningstar doesn't think that you want to go into a market a year like 2023 and say, hey, well, a recession is definitely coming. I am going to sell everything and go to cash because I'm 100% sure that this is going to happen. A recession is just one possible outcome in a wide range of outcomes. And I mentioned that when the range of outcomes is wide, uh, typically the response that you want from a portfolio perspective is, is again, not necessarily to be negative, but it's just to sort of shrink the the bets that you have in your portfolio. So let's say you take the classic 60-40 portfolio. Um, you know, I I heading into maybe 2023, um, you know, maybe you had an overweight to equity. Now is a time where we, we would get back to something like 60%, but it doesn't mean we're taking our 60-40 portfolio and going to 55 or 50 or, you know, 20, anything like that. Like that's a really big bet in the other direction that sometimes folks don't necessarily understand that they're taking. Um, and, you know, there's, a, there's something uh, in markets that is true, which is that 
generally investors underperform investments. There's a lot of research out there that you can find around this topic, but this is driven by the fact that people tend to overreact to these types of things. And so we want to be careful uh, not to do that. From a portfolio perspective, just a couple of approaches. Like, let's say, you know, we do feel like a recession is right around the corner. Um, some things that we would think about doing. Uh, in Morningstar's perspective, uh, we really like portfolios that blend both active investments and passive investments. So active managers that are trying to beat the market in some way, either with greater return or lower risk. And then passive investments that are just trying to give you that market performance. You know, there's places where it can be efficient to go active, places where it can be efficient to go passive. But one of the greatest predictors of long-term success in your portfolio is actually the fees you pay on your portfolio. So be, being able to blend active and passive, passive usually having lower fees, uh, we, we think is a, is a prudent course. Um, we like to think about, especially heading into you know, a recessionary environment, stocks that have moats. So um, moats would be, as, as the name implies, right, like uh, defensive around their business. Things like switching costs, uh, intangible assets, network effects, um, scale and cost advantages. Those are the types of businesses that we look for because generally they can be more resilient to down markets. And also, you know, dividends and dividend investing, that type of in, uh, orientation can be, uh, can be good. And then finally, I would say thinking about how you can incorporate alternative assets into the portfolio, we think does make sense. Uh, as yields have come up, we, we, we like bonds again, and we like them for their diversification properties, but you don't want to put all of your diversification eggs in one basket, so to speak. So having some other uh, investments or asset classes that can uh, generally exhibit low correlation, right? They, they tend not to move in sync with equities or even in sync with bonds. That can be really additive in these types of market environments. The other thing that's interesting, um, you know, from a uh, a, like a broader market regime perspective, or even a recessionary perspective, is we sort of use these big bucket terms, but there's a lot of variation um, under the hood, right? Uh, even just this sort of simple framework of four different market regimes where you have high economic activity or low economic activity, and then low inflation or high inflation, it's really difficult to predict exactly what regime we're in. And it's even more difficult to predict like the when one, one regime is changing and, and it becoming something else. That's where I, we, we try to construct those portfolios that would almost be a dot in the middle here and then tilt them um, based on where we think we are uh, you know, on these different axes. But we, we sort of never are going to be super far in any quadrant because, again, it's, it's, it's pretty difficult to predict exactly where we are and it's pretty difficult to predict you know, when those, uh, those, those regime shifts are coming. So you, you ultimately, it's that, that whole prepare, don't predict. You want to build a portfolio that's prepared for these environments. And then as they reveal themselves, you start to tilt the portfolio uh, in one way or another. And that's, that's really the approach we take with um, our, uh, we, we, we run a set of what we call model portfolios or target risk portfolios. These range from conservative 20% equity up to essentially aggressive all equity portfolios. Um, you'll notice the only like even the bands in which we are able to tilt these portfolios are rather narrow. So if I take that 60-40 portfolio, the most we can ever be is 65, the least we can ever be is 55. We, we want to tilt, but you know, taking these big bets in the overall asset allocation of your portfolio is something that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, generally, we don't we don't think it's super prudent. Um, and then I'll just share a little bit about how we actually think about investing. Um, I'll talk about it from the perspective of the portfolio, but hopefully it's useful from the perspective of you, know, you as you're thinking about your investments. But I know this is a rather busy slide. If you just focus on the bottom here, there's essentially four pillars through which we would look at any asset class or you know, even individual security. Uh, but essentially those pillars are absolute valuation, relative valuation, what we call contrarian indicators, and then fundamental risk. So absolute valuation is just how expensive or inexpensive is this asset relative to its own history? And we'll look at things like price to fair value, price to cash flow, price to earnings. We'll also look at things like free cash flow growth and earnings growth. And then we'll look at things like dividend and buybacks in assessing absolute valuation. As the name implies, relative valuation is how does that asset stack up against the opportunity set of other assets that we could choose from, right? Where does it rank in terms of um, its its sort of uh, you know inexpensiveness? Um, contrarian indicators; these are going to be things like asset flows, 
analyst earnings, um, different signals that the uh, the team follows to understand, hey, if everyone is crowded in this type of an investment, maybe that's something that we want to be a little bit more cautious in, right? Be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. We try to you know zig when the market zags a little bit and those help us. And then fundamental risk is just uh, the risk that an asset becomes structurally impaired. So, you know, you could think of um, uh, regulation changes, geopolitical events. It's it's those types of um, uh, risks, which are actually a lot less quantifiable. They, they tend to be more qualitative, but we want to be thinking about that as we're putting together, you know, the models that I mentioned or, or really any portfolio. And, and I, you know, I would encourage any investors out there to to make sure not to forget like, you know, hey, what what are the some of the extreme tail events that could happen to these types of uh, assets? So, I hope that's a helpful conversation on uh, you know markets and a little bit about uh, how at least Morningstar thinks about investing. I want to spend a moment talking about I mentioned at the beginning what I consider to be the single greatest threat to somebody reaching their long term goals, and that's actually their ability or your ability to stay invested and and sort of follow the financial plan that you have set out with you know your professional financial advisor. Right? You don't you don't want to build the ark while it's raining. We do all of these things before we get to these turbulent market periods so that we have a plan and we know what we're executing against and we know what our long-term goals are, but still we're human beings and it's very easy to get tilted uh, and start to, you know, make big changes that generally, uh, you know, don't work out. That's why investors underperform investments. So just to give you some context for the importance of staying invested, um, this looks at uh, if you you know start. This is sort of March of 09, so basically the bottom. What happens if you actually just stayed invested in, in this case in the S and P over the entire time period since then? What happens if you waited one year? That's the red. Uh, the staying invested is the blue line. The red line is what happens if you waited one year in cash and then you were fully invested. And then the gold line is what happens if you just stayed in cash the entire time? And look, nobody's surprised. Obviously, we know markets have done very well. And so if you just stayed invested over the full market cycle, you would have you would have done more. But I, what I think is actually striking is the magnitude of that difference is not small. And, um, you know, if starting from 100,000, ending at 400 or, you know, 660, it's 260% difference in the overall performance, just from sitting out one year right at the beginning. And I, I, I think that's an important context to keep in mind. Um, I mentioned as well, um, hey, the yield curve inversion has generally been a reasonably reliable uh, predictor of recession. And that's true. We, we certainly could be heading towards one. But what I would submit to the audience here is that if you have a long-term mindset, it actually doesn't really matter whether a recession starts tomorrow or a quarter from now or you know, two quarters from now or a year from now or two. It, 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 it's If you have a long-term perspective, it doesn't matter. Um, if you have a short-term need, like if you're retiring tomorrow, it does um, from the perspective of like one of the ways you really stress a portfolio is by drawing on it at the same time the performance declines. But if you have a long time horizon, or even if you are retired and some of the money that you've been fortunate to accumulate is, is you know, legacy, you're going to leave it, that money has a long time horizon, then what I would submit to you is that whether or not we have a recession, it doesn't necessarily matter. And you can see that in this chart. This just looks at a number of different historic market events. And then the performance, one month, six months, one year, three years, five years, hence. And the point is that as the time period increases, you, you, you see the performance continues. And there's, you know, this, there's always the mentality like this time is different, but you know, there's a lot of different causes for all of these uh, different previous uh, market downturns and recessions. And yet, you know, three years, five years out markets have rebounded. Um, to me, this is one of the craziest, uh, uh, craziest, you may have seen this before, but one of the craziest statistics, it's common, which is why uh, you may have seen it before, but I think sometimes when we see something a lot, it's easy to get desensitized to it. But what this actually looks at is 25 years of investment history. And it looks at if you stay fully invested, starting with $1,000, or if you miss the single best day, five days, 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, or 40 days. I don't know if anyone out there knows offhand how many uh, trading days there are in a, in a single calendar year, but I will tell you there are 252 trading days in one calendar year. Um, over 25 years, which is what this chart, and trust me, I'm not doing the math in my head. I had this before. Uh, 25 times 252 is 6,300. 
So this single page represents 6,300 different trading days. And if you stay fully invested, you 3.2x your money, right? You go from 1,000 to 3,200. And if you just miss the best 40 days out of 6,300 days, you go from 3.2x to losing 60%. It, 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 it always, it, like literally I get excited about it. It blows my mind, but it's true. Um, and what's really interesting is that the, um, the best days tend to follow the worst days in investing. So it's, it's really hard to time. And this is why, you know, I, I, like for myself and I think others, financial professionals, we would say it's, you, you can't time this because the, the margins are so narrow and 40 out of 6,300 is 0.006% of the days. So if you just get 0.006% of the days wrong, you go from 3.2X to losing 60%. Crazy. Um, and the last thing I'll share is that look over long periods of time, and this looks back, you know, to obviously the Great Depression, like all of these big things that when we're staring at them up close, yeah, they're huge. But over a long enough time scale, and this isn't even a hundred years, um, they're not that big. Um, markets have generally, without dividends, you've you've over this time period earned about six percent on your money. If you've been reinvesting in compounding dividends, it goes up to about ten percent, and I think that's a pretty reasonable expectation if you do keep a longer term time horizon. As I mentioned, though, what's hard about that is we're human beings. So, you know, rational decision makers would have stable and well-defined preferences and they would make their choices according to those preferences. I don't know if anybody else out there feels that this describes them. I'll tell you, it definitely does not describe me. You know, I buy lottery tickets, so it, it certainly doesn't describe me. Uh, but, you know, this is where sort of like the behavioral sciences step in. And I think one of the best areas where a financial val uh, advisor is really adding value. It doesn't mean that anybody is not talented or they're dumb. It just means that we're all human beings. And as human beings, we have limited attention spans. We have meager willpower. Our memories are not great, right? There's a lot of studies out there that show that eyewitness testimony is really not that reliable. And sometimes we actually have inconsistent reasoning ability. And there are these cognitive biases that we can all slip into. And it's that, that emotional response and those cognitive biases that you know make somebody respond to a, a negative market environment in a major way, and that's why I, I, the single greatest threat to somebody reaching their goals is just whether or not they're able to stay invested and you know and ride those ups and downs. I'll give you a fun example. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers the game show Let's Make a Deal, right? Uh, Monty Hall was the host back in the '70s, uh, but it, at every point in Let's Make a Deal, and we're, we're going to play, uh, we're going to play it here. At every point in the show. Uh, Monty says to the contestant, you know, there's there's three doors. Uh, and so behind two of these doors are a goat. And behind one of these doors is a fancy red sports car. And uh, Monty says, or, I, you know, I'm Monty here, uh, pick a door. So I'm going to give everybody, you know, just a second here. And in your mind, you know, please select one of the doors. Okay. And so now uh, you have your door in your mind. I'm going to show you. Uh, a goat, right? I'm going to open one of the doors and I'm going to show you a goat. So in this case, it was door number three. So if you pick door number three, switch. Uh, but the question that I would like to pose to everyone who picked either door number one or door number two, or there's actually two questions that I would like to pose to you. The first question is, um, you know, you selected a door. Do you want to switch to the other one? So if you selected door number one, do you want to move to door number two? And if you selected door number two, do you want to move to door number one? That's the first question. The second question is, does it actually matter if you switch or not? Like, do, does it change anything? So I'm just going to give everybody, a, you know, a couple seconds to think about that concept. So the answer to this is that it actually does matter. And the correct response to this is that you should switch every single time. The reason for this, um, most people think it's a 50-50 probability, door number one, door number two, it doesn't matter. So I might as well stay with door number one if that's what I picked, but that's incorrect. It actually does matter. There is a two thirds chance that the car is in the door that you would switch to. And the reason this works is basically because I, as the host, uh, know where the car, I, I know where everything is. I know where the goats and I know where the cars are. And I have to show you a goat. And so the way that the conditional probability shift is it by switching, you end up with a two third probability of getting the car versus if you stay, you only have a one third probability of getting the car. What is interesting is on the game show, um, around 80 to 85% of the contestants did not switch. 
So even if it was a 50-50 chance, you would think, well, 50% of the people would, would switch. Not true, but it's not even a 50-50 chance. It's, it's actually two-thirds, one-third the other way. And yet 80 to 85% of people didn't switch. When you do, when um, in a lab setting, when they've done this experiment with people by letting them play the game multiple times, like multiple iterations of the game, people are still really slow. They don't figure out that the correct strategy is switching. What's funny is they they do this same lab setting with pigeons and rats, and they figure it out like almost instantly. So uh, that this is one of these cognitive biases. It's something that uh, we would typically describe as loss aversion. So it is more painful to have gotten the car right the first time and then switched away from it than it was th than it would be to never have got in the car in the first place, right? So that concept of loss aversion, it's also, if I flip back, right, that inconsistent reasoning ability, there's, you know, human brains are not necessarily always designed to solve these probabilistic puzzles very well. And so that's why 80 to 85% of the contestants didn't switch and many of them missed out on cars as a result. The uh, investing application of this is that, you know, red ink on your statement and black ink on your statement should generally have like the same weight in your mind, right? You know. Uh, you, some things go up and some things go down, and that's that's part of investing. But as human beings, this is how it looks, right? The red ink it takes over, and it's it's that concept of loss aversion when applied to an investment. Um, what the way we would describe this is the pain of losing something is greater than the pleasure of gaining something, and the research shows it's about it's it's felt about two times. So. The, the pain of losing something is felt about two times as much as the pleasure of gaining something. And this is why, you know, in these market environments, um, people can tend to, as, as, they, as they see their portfolio going down and going down and going down, they're able to resist, resist, resist. And then it gets to a point where, okay, this is too much and I'm going to hit the ejector seat. And inevitably, they tend to do that right towards the bottom. And then markets start going back up, markets start going back up. We're not, we're not totally sure. We're not totally sure. And we don't get back in until, you know, markets are almost maybe back where they were to start that whole cycle. And this is, this is again, why investors underperform investments. And it's sort of the single greatest threat to somebody reaching their long-term goals. And I think is actually one of the single greatest source. I mean, financial advisors can provide a lot of value, but just sort of being a, a coach to keep you from falling into some of these behavioral traps is, in my opinion, one of the greatest. Um, interestingly enough, what the research also says is um, how do you combat those biases yourself? Uh, it's, it's essentially by focusing on your goals and focusing in on the long term and focusing on what you can control. So rather than what your statement says this quarter or next quarter or what, you know, the market's off a couple hundred points today, those are generally not the things to focus on. What you want to focus on is, am I actually on track for my re retirement, which, you know, your advisor will be able to work with you on, you know, am I on track to pay for my kid's education? It's these, it's these goals in the long that you want to anchor your thinking around. And that helps uh, sort of combat these different biases. It's also important to think about what you control, right? So you don't control market performance. You don't control whether a recession is coming or whether it's not com coming. What you actually do control, though, is the amount of contributions that you're making into your portfolio. That's one of the greatest predictors of long-term success. Uh, I mentioned you know, fees. That's a great you know, predictor of long-term success. So you want to focus on the things that you can control, and you want to focus on your goals. And it's important to remember that like having a diversified portfolio is not a goal. Having a 60-40 portfolio is not a goal. These are sort of like the means that allow us to reach those goals, but but re-anchor yourself uh, to that. And so just in in landing the plane here and closing and you know what what really matters for investor success, I'm gonna lean on one of the most successful successful, if not the most successful investor of all time. That's Warren Buffett. And Warren says to invest successfully over a lifetime does not require stratospheric IQ, unusual business insights or inside information. What's needed is a sound intellectual framework for making decisions and then the ability to keep emotions from corroding that framework. And I think that's one of the, um, you know, sort of best summations of what it means to be uh, a long-term investor and have a plan and a process. So I really appreciate everybody's time today. Hopefully this is helpful. Um, I'm, you know, certainly happy to take questions. I don't know if, if Brad is coming back in here, uh, but I'm, 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 I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Hey, Mike, thank you very much. Uh, great stuff. Uh, and I, I appreciate all that we learned today. And by the way, I think I want a goat. So at some point we can settle up on the goat. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, fascinating stuff. Can you hear me okay, Mike? I can. Great, great.
So uh, while we wait for some of the questions to build, um, I, I just wanted to share with you a couple of things that I heard. And if you want to provide any other uh, background, that'd be great. So um, I heard that uh, it's always best to prepare, not predict. And I think in the environment that we're in today, uh, is a recession looming? Is a recession not looming? You know, are we are we headed out of this or not? I think that's a great solution or great advice that you gave. So. Um, anything else you want to talk about around the prepare, not predict? Yeah. So I, without mm, trying to get too technical, what I would say is that um, it's easier to predict the outcome. Uh, it's easier to predict the outcome of an event rather than the probability of the event itself. So like an election can be a good example of this or Brexit can be a good example of this, right? Like uh, which way the vote might go is actually a really hard thing to predict. But how markets might respond if candidate A wins or candidate B wins, or you know they vote to leave or they vote to remain, that actually you can stress test and you can you can kind of build a portfolio around. So when we're heading into these big events and this gets into sort of the prepare don't predict, it's it's really hard to predict the probability of what will happen. But you actually do have there is some skill in predicting. Given something has happened, how will assets respond? And, and that's a bit about how we build portfolios. Gotcha. Thanks, Mike. Um, you know, something else that I heard that I really liked is investors typically under, underperform investments. I, I, I like that. I think that's great advice. Also, what I heard uh, when you were sharing the chart about uh, leap, being out of the best days in the market, and you're right in my own experience that the best days in the market often follow some of the worst days, some very tumultuous tumultuous times. And if we're using the emotional side of our brain, that often tends to be the time when people want to get out the most. Uh, and if they only knew that the great times were just on the other side of that, I think it's, it's important to remind our members to go see their advisor, that dispassionate person who can help them process the emotions they're having around what's going on in the market and then help them make better rational decisions about their future and about their investments. So I think that's great advice. Appreciate all that you've done today. And so uh, I don't think there's any other questions in the queue. So I'll just uh, end today, Mike. Thank you so much for joining us. And then everybody on the call, thank you again for joining us. We'll follow up with a recording of this webinar and we'll post it on our website. So please feel free to share that with anyone whom you feel may have interest in our topic today. And if you have questions or would like to speak to one of our advisors, please reach out to myself, any Community America employee, and they'll get you connected to an advisor. If you already have an advisor, uh, please feel free to connect with them for a deeper dive and uh, be, be happy to share in a conversation with you. So again, thank you so much for coming. We hope to see you soon. Take care.